Genesis, starting in chapter 15, uh, I'm going to start at verse 7. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of, the, of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kenamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So God's covenant with Abraham, chapter 15. You know, just kind of picture Abraham gazing up into the sky and contemplating God's promise. When God told him, you, sh you shall have your offspring shall come from your own, uh, so shall your offspring be, multitudes. And he believed the Lord. Now, he saw the stars when he looked up there, and then beyond the stars, he saw the promise that God made him, and beyond the promise, he saw God himself. And you know, Abraham believed. He believed that a multitude of people would come from his body. And, and God attributed that belief, he credited his belief to him as righteousness. Abraham's righteousness was all God's doing. And he applies it not only to Abraham, but all of us. Do you believe God's promises? What's the main promise he gives? Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not through Buddha, not through a false Christ, not through an angel, not through a created being, but through Jesus Christ. And you know, that's the main promise he gives us. If we believe in him, if we believe what the word of God says, know that you will be in heaven. And you have to, you know, but sometimes we get a lot of these promises and, and we, we focus on the promise itself, but not on God. We kind of, we, we focus on the benefits God gives us. Nothing wrong with that, but we forget God. And there comes a time when we grow in the faith you know, God comes first. No matter what circumstance you're going through, no matter what health issues you're going through, no matter what financial troubles you're going through, yes, God makes promises, but God's behind all of it. He's behind. It's Him that we have to cling to. You know, and, and, and so the Lord's, his, his promise to Abraham had two parts. One was a people, a multitude of people will come from you, and the other one is land. Because look at verse 7. It says, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of, the, of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. The beginning of the chapter, 15, I guess it's verse 2, he says, But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? 
and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. God is telling him at that point, the child's going to come from Sarah. The child's going to come from you and Sarah. So one of the promises he's, he's assuring Abraham is going to come to pass while you're still here, while you're still alive. You're going to see it's going to be Isaac. But this other promise with land is not going to come to pass in his life, right? And so some of the promises God gives us comes to pass while we're living. Others, I'm going to say majority of them, don't come to pass until we get to heaven. And so we always have to remember that. But here's the other thing I saw in this in verse 7. It says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. It's the same exact grammar structure as Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. Let me read that. Gen Exodus, oh, I say, man. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. It's the same grammar structure when he says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And so the two, some of the, the two most important events in the history of the Jewish people was Abraham's exodus from Ur. That's when he, he, he chose Abraham, I'm going to make the nation of Israel out of you. And Moses' exodus from Egypt, out of uh, Egypt, is the same exact uh, grammar. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I've mentioned this before, but now take a look at this. It says, Moses, and God saying to Moses, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought Kenny out of the world. I brought you, Wade, out of the world. I brought Frank out of the world. Out of the house of bondage, out of the house of sin, I brought you out. And now here's the Ten Commandments. It's not the Ten Commandments while you're in your sin. Because what does it say back in Exodus chapter 4? When Moses thought he was going to bring him out. Let me find it here. And remember he went out to the people that were under hard bondage. And says, I oh, probably won't be able to find it. When he came to them and they said, it literally says they weren't able to hear Moses, because of the burden of, of bondage they were in. They weren't able to hear the word of God. And so what God has to do is he comes and he takes you out of the world into his kingdom. Now you can hear the word of God. Now it means something to you. That's why the Bible is written to believers. But in verse 8 it says, And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Abraham's question was prompted by faith, you see, and God knew it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a he wasn't stumbling. It was, he was asking in faith. It reminds me of, of Mark 9, 24, when the father says, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. That's kind of what Moses, that, I mean, Abraham is saying here. It's not a question of doubt that Abraham's raising, but a question of of further evidence about the promise. If anything, it's more faith. He's saying, I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to give me the land. I know the air is going to come through me. The first is going to come in his lifetime, and the second won't. You know, requests for signs in the Old Testament was, was normal. It was something that happened, you see, throughout the Old Testament. And they were to discover God's will. It wasn't to discover God's will. It was to confirm it. Remember Gideon in Judges 6 or Hezekiah in, in 2 Kings chapter 20? So the Lord's not shy in letting, his, in letting you know uh, when your faith is beginning to waver or you want more uh, evidence over something about his will. It depends on the motive you come to him with. And he did it with uh, Moses and he did it with member Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, when he went into the temple. Look at verses 9 through 11. He said, So he said to him, Bring me a three year old heifer, a three year old female goat, a three year old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle 
and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. See, in the ancient world, and it's all over literature, it's, it's really easy to find. In the ancient world, it, 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 there's evidence that animals were slaughtered in every nation to make treaties, to make these treaties uh, contracts. And, uh, and you always had to have, when you read some of these ancient Near East uh, treaties, you always had the two people making the treaty walking through the cut pieces. And they were like saying to each other, uh, if you break the uh, treaty, then you'll be cursed. If I break the treaty, I'll be cursed. And that's, the, the, that's what's being described here. Abraham knew exactly what God was ordering him to do because that was the custom of the day. That was, he was making a covenant. And, uh, and from what he knew, understood at that time, it was going to be a covenant between God and him. Two people are going to walk through that, right? Just like in the custom of the day. When you say custom of the day, what does that mean? It, you know, when I, I, I apply the principle of that is every single human being is made in the image of God. You know what our custom is? Our custom is to worship something above us. Because God has put that in us. That's the custom of every human being. Just like this was a custom back in the ancient Near East to do this treaty. Abraham didn't know at that point how it was going to be done. But he understood what God was telling him to do. Make a treaty. Get these animals ready because we're going to make a treaty together. And so God has put in each person this... this uh, a desire to worship God. The problem is majority of the people worship a false God. Ma majority of the people, they, they come to the, they know they, there's something bigger than themselves, and so they, 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 they come to a church, they come, they form together and they worship a God. Problem is, a lot of them worship the wrong God. You know, you get into 1 Corinthians 10.20 it says 1 Corinthians 10.20 rather that, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God and I don't want you to have fellowship with demons now this is important, I'll get back to this in a minute and here's the other thing too that's important, Abraham is directed to use five distinctive animals, he, he lists them uh, and, and all of these animals would become standard sacrifices that the Mosaic Covenant, when it was instituted, those were the animals that were going to be used. What I'm trying to say here is every nation went through the same motions as Abraham and God are about ready to do. It wasn't something just completely uh, new. And that's what God does with us. In verses 12 through 16, it says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will reflect them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So here's Abraham. So he's getting ready to make this treaty with God. And, but a deep sleep falls upon, upon Abraham. God get, has him go and fall into a deep sleep. And now, and, and in that deep sleep is a terrifying darkness that surrounds him. Remember later at the covenant at Sinai, will be in, in inaugurated in similar darkness. And what else was in similar darkness? The new covenant of Christ's blood when the darkness came over the cross. So this darkness engulfed Abraham when he's ready to, for this covenant. And the dread of terror is brought upon on him simply because of the presence of God. God is there. His presence is there. And it's a human emotion brought on by the Lord's presence. 
And you know, I think back at Peter in Luke 5, when Peter, when he finally he obeyed the Lord and he caught all that fish and he, he realized he got a glimpse of Christ's deity and what did he do? He fell on his face and what did he say? Depart from me for I am a sinner. But what about Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter 6 when he saw the vision of God on, it was Jesus Christ on his throne. And Isaiah fell to his face and said, Woe is me, I am unclean. And this is kind of what's happening to Abraham here. And we're because we're still sinners on earth. We may say, I hope Jesus Christ walks through that door. I hope that I, I can have this, this massive vision of God and his presence. Well, we gotta be careful there. Because we're still sinners in this body. We can't see God. But you know, the other thing is, but when we get to heaven, when we get to heaven in the sinless environment, with sinless bodies, sinless minds. We're going to be completely transformed. There won't be any traces of sin. Then we will com completely enjoy the presence of God like we never have before. And you know, it says here, uh, uh, God's telling Abraham uh, in verse 15, Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. To go to one's grave peacefully means to come to the end of one's life with a sense of contentment and fulfillment. And I'm standing up here telling you, you're thinking right now, when I'm on that deathbed, it's gone through my mind. I know I'm going to wonder, I wish I would have done more or something to that extent. You're, no, you're not. You're not. You're not going to be thinking that, I guarantee you. Because what happens when you're on your deathbed I'm convinced of this. Is God fills you so much that He takes you into heaven and glory. You would have you have no fear of death. Trust me on this. He will fill you. You're not gonna and, and the day that He takes you home, the minute He takes you home, you're gonna die peacefully. That's all believers. You know, if the Amorites, it says here. But in, in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. See, God waits. And, 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 and he waits until he passes judgment on people in this life. Most of us, most non-believers, will not meet God's judgment until they die. Some nations, let me say nations, come to the end of their existence because of the sin that they they fall into and God judges that nation. We, what we do as non-believers is we, we take God's patience to the extreme. Non-believers do. And you know, it's a serious thing when you sit there and tell somebody, God loves you so much. He does. But sometimes that gives a false sense to that person. Well, if God really loves me, it doesn't really matter how I live. Sometimes we need that fear of God in us, just like Abraham's experiencing right now. It's a way that it gets our attention. In verses 17 through 21, it says, And it came to pass, when the sun went down, and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gegershites, and the Jebusites. You know, let me go back to that treaty. So, because here we go with the treaty. The smoking fire pot and the flaming torch reminds us of the smoke and fire that surrounded Mount Sinai. And fire in the Bible, just like uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, uh, is often a symbol of the presence of God. This is the presence of God Abraham's experiencing. It's a fiery appearance of a smoke and fire pot with radiating orange. Why does it radiate orange? That means it's hot <laughs> and you can't even touch it. It was a theophany. A visible manifestation of God. But notice the difference. 
between this covenant and the rest of the what the ancient Near East practiced. God alone would fulfill the covenant. Abraham was not asked for any assistance. It's God alone that went through the animals. Not two people. It's not God and me. I do my part. God, God does his part. Remember I said that was a custom of the day. Abraham, before God put him in that deep sleep, probably thought both him and God were going to walk through this uh, animals and make a treaty together. God saying, put him in a deep sleep and said, only I'm going through it. Because I'm the one that's going to perform the covenant. The pagan treaties all had man and God making the agreement together. But God is the only one going through the animals here. And that's what's different. What's different with a true Christian worship? Like I said, the custom of the day, they knew what these treaties meant. But God does it differently. We all have, as, as human beings, we're all made in the image of God, and we have this desire to worship God. That's, there's no atheist. That's how God made the human being. That's what being made in the image of God is. But some end up in false religion. Some end up not going through Jesus Christ. That's why I have 15, 30, 40 different religions. It's only God that fulfills the covenant that makes the way for salvation, Christ on the cross. You know, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Christ. You see, every other false religion, I'll say false religion, or any other people sitting in a true church that's not saved, they all have one thing in common, and that's I have to do something. It can be 99% God and 1% me, but I have to do something. A true Christian depends completely on God. It's only God going through this. It's only God making this. So, but what figure? So Abraham sees a vision of a fire pot going through this. By what figure would God have demonstrated his commitment even more vividly to Abraham? He did. Remember, he said Abraham saw his day. He said, Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced in it. For the living God, the only way he could make it even plainer was for the living God to take on human nature and taste the death of the covenant-breaking children of Abraham. And that's exactly what he did. Christ came, 100% God, 100% man, and those natures never mixed. This is, another, this is another evidence if you're a true Christian or not. Do you believe that, that God, Jesus Christ is two natures, one God? Two natures, one person, the God-man. Two natures that don't mix. That's why the creeds, Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, all say without mixture, without confusion. Those natures never mix. It's, the, it's unique. It says in the Greek, he's the unique, one and only Son of God. Jesus Christ is 100% man and 100% God, and those natures never mix. He's the God-man, and that's how he fulfilled the covenant for us. He laid aside his glory and became fully human and voluntarily went to the cross as a sinless sacrifice. And just as Abraham was engulfed in darkness and God was in the darkness, went through that, Jesus Christ... When the cross went dark for three hours, was paying the price of sin. All those who trust in the redeeming work of Christ receive a land that Abraham and the rest of the Old Testament saints went to, a city built by God. Hebrews chapter 11. Beloved, it's only through Christ. 